Greetings, my name is Michael Wilson, and I serve as the president of the Southeastern Conference with headquarters in Mount Dora, Florida. Today, I would like to share a few words of encouragement with you from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 to 16. But before we do so, let us pray. Father, our God, we just want to thank for your word. And we ask now as we look at your word that you may open up our minds and our hearts to receive your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. What is the one thing that you would stop at nothing to get? What is at the top of your list of things to pursue at all costs? Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 through 16 tells us that wisdom should be put on top of that list. This is what the verse says. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand and in her left are riches and honor. That is from the English Standard Version. The main point of this text is quite clear. Put wisdom at the top of your list of things to do go after. Set your sight on wisdom. Pursue wisdom at any cost. God through Proverbs chapter 3 verses 13 to 16 is calling us to orient our lives around the pursuit of wisdom. But one may ask, why should we pursue wisdom like this? What is the benefit? Before we answer that question, we need to know what wisdom actually is. So as used in this text, wisdom is the ability to act according to accurate knowledge, which comes from God. To put it simply, wisdom, according to the Bible, is the ability to make godly decisions. So the question is, why should we pursue wisdom? The, the verse tells, verse 16 tells us that answer. Verse 60, the wise man tells us that wisdom will give you long life, riches, and honor. There's nothing this world has to offer that can compare with wisdom. Every day should include us begging for wisdom. See, wisdom, as we pointed out earlier, is the ability to make godly choices. It is living in light of God's word and acting accordingly. Unfortunately, you cannot just find wisdom or buy it. It takes intentional, committed decision to pursue it. And when we choose to do this, God promises that he will help us. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, and God would grant him or her that wisdom. And so even in your retirement years, after you've labored long for God, I just want to encourage you day by day to seek and to pursue wisdom. Make it your priority. Seek to make godly choices. Seek to live according to God's will. And the promise of God's word is that you'll be blessed. Is that you have honor and riches will be yours. God bless you. And I'm praying for you. And I ask that you continue to pray for us as well. As together, we look forward to the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.
Among them, historian, minister, and humanitarian. But three words cannot fully describe the incredible impact Dr. C.E. Dudley had on the church and the South Central Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Elder Dudley's mother introduced him to Adventism, and for his senior year of high school, he attended and graduated from Oakwood Academy. After completing his secondary education at Oakwood College, for almost two decades, he pastored multiple churches in the southern and southwestern regions of the United States. In 1962, he was elected president of the South Central Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. As president of the conference, his tenure lasted for an unprecedented 31 years. During his term, as many as 10 ministers were mentored and went on to become conference presidents. Under his leadership, church membership and tithing increased, which led to the need for more pastors and teachers. As a result, congregations grew, creating the need for more churches and schools. Under Dr. Dudley's leadership, seven low-income housing complexes were built. He also oversaw financial support for Oakwood College that was in excess of $16 million. After 40 years of conference ownership, the sale of the HUD housing projects has made it possible for the Dudley Foundation to be established. Among his many accomplishments, Dr. Dudley established the only conference-based supplemental retirement program. He co-established the annual regional evangelism program and created the Black Adventist Medical Dental Organizations for SDAs. One of his noteworthy accomplishments was the sponsorship of a number of students from Africa, three of which were Dr. Benson, Muga Manchuro, Seth Bardu, and Edmund Julius. Dr. C.E. Dudley will be remembered by future generations for enriching young lives by investing in their future. That is the prevailing goal of the Charles and Etta Dudley Foundation. Greetings, everyone. I'm Doris Gothard from Lake Region Conference. Our conference president is Elder Garth Gabriel, and I serve with him as the Finance Committee Chairperson for Lake Region Conference. This is an honor and a privilege for me to share a few retirement tips with you. But may I say before I begin, that I started my retirement planning on day one of my employment with General Motors. It was a part of GM's culture to encourage every new employee to begin on the first day of their employment with the corporation to begin their retirement planning. I started my retirement planning. I started saving even when I felt I couldn't save and I have been saving ever since. Now we'll get off to just an, a little smile on a lot of our, our female uh, constituents in the regional conferences by saying, I've been saving my money since the first day of my retirement, planning for my retirement. I'm now retired. 
and I have not spent any of my retirement money. I'm just spending Donald's money. That's the best kind of retirement plan. But let me just tell you that I have six tips for retirement planning that I want to share with all of the regional conference employees, retirees, or those that are planning for retirement sometime in the not too distant future. I want you to see them. I'll share my screen with you. Here they are. They're very simple. It doesn't matter. It's not about money. It doesn't matter how much money you have if you have poor health. So I say the first tip for planning for anyone's retirement is to put your mental and your physical and your emotional health first. The second tip, saving matters. As I shared with you, I started saving for my retirement on the first day of my employment with General Motors many years ago. You start saving and you keep saving just as I continue to do, and then you don't quit. Now, tip number three, you need a plan. And I encourage everyone to create a retirement and an estate plan. Know what your needs are. In other words, if you know how you're living today and you're working and earning income, then give some thought as to how you want to live when you no longer have the job with the full-time salary income. So you need to know your needs. I kept track of my needs and the lifestyle that I had the home that I lived in while I worked, I'm still living in that same home at the same standards, the same level. And the process, you review your plan annually, just in case you need to make some changes because things happen and things change and you want to make sure that your plan is up to date. Time, time is so precious. We praise God for time. No matter what your work is in the regional conference, in the church, whether you are a pastor or an executive leader or a lay member, remember to take time. Tomorrow is not promised. Take time for yourself and for your family. And be positive. I practice keeping a positive attitude. It goes a long way. And then the last tip, tip number six, is live well. I'm living my best life because I had a plan. God bless the plan. And I'm sticking to the plan following these simple steps. And for the Christian, for the leader, my uh, little secret is to living well, exercise your faith, keep the faith, hope, and then a loving spirit so that you can be a positive influence on others. I hope you appreciated those six tips. I'm going to spend most of my time on tip number three, and this is about the plan. Every worker, every employee, and most definitely every executive leader of our regional conference, I can't imagine that we would have an executive leader in our regional conference that would not have a retirement plan. That's a document in writing. It's a plan of action. So that should something happen to you, the designee in your plan would have it in writing. My husband has one, two, three, four, five steps should something happen to him. I wouldn't have to be in a panic to reach out to anyone else. I just go to that secure place, get my steps and follow it. You need a retirement plan, which is a plan of action to distribute your assets. Now, many of you, many of you might be thinking at this moment, well, I don't have a lot of money. Listen, if you have a quilt that was given to you by your great, great, great grandmother, and it is of some value to you, that's an asset, whatever God has blessed you with. And in your retirement planning, this documentation needs to be in documents in a place where someone that you trust knows where they are. If you need help in creating a retirement plan, I always recommend that you work with an estate or a financial planner, and I have done both of those things. All retirement planning 
there's no one template good for every household, every individual. It's different and unique for each family. Your financial planner and your estate planner will help you with that. But by all means, if you see step first step and second step, this is important. In my family with my husband, Donald, we probably have maybe four attorneys. They are like um, our go-tos. They feel almost like a part of the family, but they have specialties in different areas. You need to consult, I recommend highly, with an attorney, whether you are doing a a will or a trust, and I'll get to that in a moment, but make sure you identify an attorney that can help you uh, create your own retirement plan. And then the second step is, while you are alive, if you know that you have some legal issues that have not been resolved, I encourage you to settle those things, get them resolved before your death. You need an outline, that's your plan of action just in case you become incapacitated or in the case of your death and find someone that you trust that would do right by your children, that would do right by making sure that your wishes were carried out just like you desired. Designate someone who can handle your assets or someone that can speak for you if it's a health matter and you're unable to make those decisions. And lastly, I'll say the tip is, find and work with an estate planner and a financial planner. Documents can be things like a will. Now, I know we can find so many things that that are on the internet, but my advice to you would be, don't just rely on the internet for everything. I would consult with an attorney, even for the will. At a minimum, every person should have a will. You're not too old uh, to have one. A will and then a trust. I'll tell you more about that, but of a revocable trust is almost an absolute necessity for every executive level church leader. Every, Every single leader should have a revocable trust and include it in that trust or, you know, your will and the other do- documents that will be needed for someone to act on your behalf. Documents will allow or a family member or a trusted friend to make important decisions uh, on your behalf in a crisis when you're unable to do so. There are three major benefits of this push that I have right now for you, and that is in these documents, these retirement documents. Number one is privacy. If the doctor's office has us to sign off that they will treat our medical history information with privacy, then certainly while we're alive, we ought to be able to have the appropriate documents just in case we're incapacitated or in the case of our untimely death. You want to have these documents in place to protect the privacy of your name, your namesake, your family. You want to be able to have personal control while you are alive to put these things in place so that when you are unable to make decisions, your wishes will be carried out. There's ease of administration when you do these things. It puts order and it puts clarity to your personal, financial, and medical affairs. I encourage you to get your house in order while we're still alive. There are five different types of trust. I will not spend time on all five of them, but I want you to hear them and to see them. The revocable trust, I'll speak a little bit more about that, but that's the most commonly used uh, trust that most of us have. That's what I have, as a matter of fact. And then you have the irrevocable trust, the amenities trust, the cottage trust, the charitable remainder trust. These are various trusts that will address the very specific needs that some families have with maybe children that have um, problems with addiction, with drugs or alcohol, or if there is a child that uh, suffers from a disability of some kind, then if you work with your estate planner and the financial planner, that person will lead and guide you to the specific kind of trust that will serve your family's um, 
needs the best. The revocable trust, that's what my husband and I have. As a matter of fact, the attorney was contacted before we got married. And when we got married, uh, ink was on the paper. Day one of our marriage, we had our revocable trust documents signed. The revocable trust document is often used as a centerpiece for estate planning. And remember, estate planning has less to do with money and more to do with you just getting your affairs in order. The revocable trust basically does two things. It helps you avoid probate court and probate taxes. Anyone that has a will or does not have a will, whatever it is you have, I don't care if it's $150 in your checking account. If you have no will or a will, everything in the event of your death will have to go through probate. And I know one, no one wants to spend any money on lawyer's fees and probate um, taxes that you will have to pay to the court. So just remember that there is great value in having a trust. The revocable trust, in my view, is superior to the will. In other words, courts don't allow the trust to be challenged. So it would be upheld legally in court if you had a trust, whatever the desire of whatever your uh, assets were, it would be covered in the trust and that's covered by law. Unlike a will, any person on the face of the earth, relative or non-relative, if they choose, they can contest a will. So I encourage you to see the value in having, having a trust. And I pray that all church leaders will have a trust. The revocable trust um, has two more benefits, I think. The fourth one is your trust assets can be distributed um, for certain events. It could be uh, to a grandchild or a great grandchild and you want to have a certain amount of funds distributed to them when they enter college or when they graduate from college or if it could be, it could be for a child that has a drug addiction problem and during your lifetime, your encouragement to that child was I want you to go to a drug treatment program and complete it, then in your trust, you could have a provision for that family member or for that relative or child or grandchild. And then the trust could specifically say that these funds can be distributed to this loved one upon completion of the um uh, the drug rehab program. They'd have to show proof to the to the trustee or the executive of your estate. But that's a very, very, very good, valuable point to having a trust because you can, in your lifetime, you can have some control of over how you want your assets and your funds distributed and used. Work with a financial planner. Now, again, a will is just simply a, li a list of instructions. I recommend getting an attorney that does wills to create it for you so that it gets notarized correctly for you and will be recognized by the courts. I realize you can go to the internet, but I certainly wouldn't recommend it. It's just a list of instructions. Remember, any will can be contested by any person, a non-relative, a friend, anybody can, can contest a will. And remember this too, all wills must, they do, they go through probate court. And there you have other fees and taxes, but anybody can challenge it. It's just a simple list of instructions. There's a living will, and that will simply state your wishes regarding life support, whether or not um, um, you want to be resuscitated or whether or not you just like to, um, to have your end of life come in a very natural way. Um, all of these things can be in these documents. You can express your will and desire. And then the HIPAA disclosure form, you know, make sure you have that filled out so that the person that you have given directive to speak for you when you're unable to do that in a medical situation, in a crisis situation, um, will know how to act and respond to physicians, uh, hospitals, or wherever you're being cared for. Um, based upon what your wishes have been expressed during your lifetime. 
durable power of attorney for financial, durable power of attorney for health care. Now, keep in mind, these things are very, very important, but they have power for the person that you've given uh, the authority to have power of attorney to uh, take care of your financial uh, needs, uh, your um, health care uh, needs, but only during your lifetime. The power of attorney documents are only good during the lifetime, but the trust will cover you during your lifetime. It's a working living document. You can change it at any time. If you had beneficiary one in the trust and something happened, no longer do you want to leave assets to beneficiary number one. You can change that during your lifetime because you are the executor of your trust during your lifetime. It's, it's really, really, really a very important thing to do. All of these documents. There are many, many, many advantages. I don't have time to go through all of them, but there are many, many, many advantages to the revocable trust agreement. Avoiding probate is at the top of my list. The revocable trust agreement does not require any court supervision. That trust documented, it's, it's like it's the law. <laughs> in your lifetime, that's what you identified in that trust. And the courts will honor it. And people will get in trouble if they try to contest whatever you have in your revocable living trust. I'm living well under my trust and it's wonderful to be able to change it. <laughs> when we have conversations and changes need to be made. Problems with jointly had pro held property. Won't spend a lot of time on this, but in marriages, sometimes, you know, uh, mortgages, property, real estate, is in one name or in both names. You want to work with your financial planner and your estate and or your estate planner um, to make sure you understand the difference between you know jointly held properties and those that are not jointly held. Most people don't know the difference or the implications in these and what problems they can cause, but you'll want to get this vetted with your financial planner or the estate planner to make sure that you have yourself covered with regards to um, jointly held properties. Special needs trust, I've mentioned this before, if you have children or relatives that you want to have uh, some asset um, being received by them in your trust, if they have some disability, you'll want to be uh, mindful that you'll need to work with an attorney, work with your financial planner, work with your estate planner, because if some uh, individuals who are who are on disability and they receive government um, assistance of any kind, they may not be able to receive directly something that you may leave them in your will or in your trust. So you'll want to check on that and find a way your lawyer or the financial planner or estate planner can help you navigate those situations, especially with individuals, you know, that have disabilities, whether it's drugs or whether it's um, um, uh, medical. You can have a distribution of your assets done in a non-direct way to that particular individual that has the disability. And that would be the best way for you to recognize them. Well, I'm at the end of this conversation and I just wanna share with you again, my six simple tips for retirement planning. Prioritize, prioritize, take care of your health. Go for a walk three or four times a week, at least 15 or 20 minutes. Put your mental and your physical and your emotional health first. And then remember, you're planning for retirement. If you haven't started saving, I never say it's too late, no matter what your age is. But you got to start. And I say start now. Save, save, start saving now. Keep saving and then don't spend it. Follow Doris Gothard's example. <laughs> save, save, save. I haven't spent any of mine since I started my first day on the job with General Motors. But I tell you, at the end of my life, what I will do with what God has blessed me with will be a part of my retirement plan, my estate plan. 
And that's the time that I think God says for me is the best time to bless others. Plan, plan, plan. Take time for yourself and your family. Keep a positive attitude. It'll take you a long way. And then live well. Live your best life. I'm living my best life in retirement because of the plan that I've started on the first day of work on my job with GM many, many, many years ago. Faith, hope, and a loving spirit will be a positive witness for Jesus. I want to thank you in my book, Finances and Spirituality, for the Christian, I want to remind us all that God wants us to get out of debt. And he wants us to have a personal plan for keeping our retirement and financial goals in spiritual alignment with his word. I want to thank the Regional Conference Retirement Plan members, employees, especially the director, Dr. Cox, and especially Dr. Baker for this invitation. Thank you all for joining. I hope you found this information helpful. You can tell I'm really passionate about the benefits of retirement planning among church leaders, especially among our executive leaders who are leading the rest of us. But I'm passionate about church members, Christian believers, getting your plan in place, God's plan for your retirement. My goal is to help people understand the benefits of planning for retirement. May God bless you all. Thank you for this time. This is my contact information. It's been my privilege and my blessing. Start saving, start planning, so that you can live your best life during your retirement years. God bless.